Good morning and happy Father's Day. Um, Lori found this really neat quote, and I want to read it to you. It says, One father is more than a hundred schoolmasters. That was said by George Hebert, who, Herbert, who was from 1593 to 1633, a Puritan. Uh, very insightful of the importance of fatherhood. And what is interesting in our culture today is that we live um, in, with a catastrophe of fatherlessness. There's an article I just got through reading. I just want to highlight a little bit of it to you as we segue into reading and going through Proverbs chapter 2. In it is Dr. Jerry Newcomb, who used to work with D. James Kennedy. He said, uh, much of the mayhem we see today is linked to fatherlessness. And I think that's a, you know, the uh, obvious thing today. He says, fathers, and I've talked about this before, it seems like men in general, fathers in particular, have really been receiving a bad rap. Uh, they're not respected as they used to be. As I just read George Herbert saying, one father is worth more than. Uh, I remember back growing up, uh, television shows called Father Knows Best, or Leave It to Beaver, or My Three Sons. And in all of those shows carried with it the weight of the importance of, of the dad in the home. But as time has progressed and devolved, if you will, we got things like Archie Bunker, which I never liked, all in the family. He was that bigoted person that was a blighted, benighted patriarch that I don't think anybody should really want to model. But then you have the Homer Simpson. Of course, I've never watched The Simpsons, and so... All I've seen is just highlights of it where the dad is a buffoon. Um, he's anything but a proper role model. And then coupled on top of that, you have many homes that they don't even have dads. They're, they're absent, the absent father. And I think that because of the absence of the father, it's, it just spirals a society downward because there's no longer a sense of a cohesiveness of proper teaching from, from the home. Um, Dr. Nukin says, he says, uh, so many of the children in fatherless homes begin life at a serious disadvantage. The breakdown of the family uh, at large has caused a huge crisis in our society. And statistics bear that out. The majority of men who are in prisons come from fatherless homes. It's a blight. It's a blight on our culture today. Um, he quotes, and it's, it's kind of a lengthy article, but I only want to highlight just a few things that he says. He quotes Charles Krismer, who wrote a book called Hearts of the Father, and noted that many American children today lack the God-ordered earthly anchor for soul security. That's, that's the import behind the Proverbs that I'll be reading in a moment, is that it's the dad is, is, creates that soul security in the life of his children. But it doesn't happen because dad is not in the home today. Here's what he says, quote, this is, he's quoting a book. He says, it is well known but seldom discussed, whether in the church house or the white house, that fatherlessness lies at the root of nearly all of the most glaring problems that plague our modern, now post-Christian life. And I think you would agree with me that we are now seeing it in an explosive manner of all the uprising, the rioting that is going on. These are young people who have been poorly taught, coming out of poorly influential homes, that is, dad is absent in some form or fashion. Now, I, I think, and I agree with Dr. Newcomb here, who says, obviously, children uh, in fatherless homes can survive. Uh, we have a great man working with uh, President Trump, Ben Carson, who proves that. 
but oftentimes it's the exception and not the rule. It is better by God's design that the family act and that dad leads the way. There's a link between fatherlessness and unbelief. Uh, I, there's an author I used to really like to read, Dr. Paul Witz, and, and uh, Dr. Newcomb quotes him. He wrote a book, The Faith of the Fatherless, and he showed many famous atheists and skeptics in history had virtually no father figure in their life whatsoever. Some examples, Voltaire, Bertrand Russell, who highly influential in the 60s of atheism, H.G. Wells, Frederick Nietzsche, a man who also an atheist who influenced our culture dramatically, Jean Paul Sartre, Thomas Hobbes, Sigmund Freud, and others. All of these came out of homes vacant of a dad. Witz found that strong believers often have positive father figures. And in an interview, he said this, I would say the biggest problem in the country is the breakdown of the family. The biggest problem in the breakdown in the family is the absence of the father. Our answer is to recover the faith, particularly for men, and we'll recover fatherhood. And if we recover fatherhood, we'll recover the family. If we recover the family, we'll recover our society. Those are well said words, and that's what I want to encourage dads with these words today, of that our responsibility is to instill spiritual wisdom in the life of our children in order that they may be able to function well in our society, that they would not succumb to the to the horrendous things that occur around them. In Proverbs, the word wisdom permeates the whole book. And the question that one must ask is, what is wisdom? And wisdom is developing the skill, life skills in the life of our children to live in a godly way. It involves learning God's ways from his word and then incorporating right choices according to his word, according to the truth, into their life. Wisdom is intended to be, I say it this way, uh, laced with heavenly thoughts. And they're intended, the intention behind teaching our children this is to be discerning and have a sense of God's holy character as to how they are to live. As I just was reading and Paul Witz was verifying, the, the learning of this wisdom begins within the family structure and is to be orchestrated by the dad. It is not minimizing mom's influence whatsoever, but this is the way God has ordained the family. God's priority for wisdom living is to begin within the very structure of the home. He commanded at the very beginning, as he created Adam and Eve, that that this was to be the structure of training up our children. And so we have Proverbs here that equally affirms that and attests and it illustrates it throughout. In fact, the first nine chapters of Proverbs concern the father's instructing of wisdom to his children, his sons in particular. We find in this chapter here that nearly every line speaks that speaks about wisdom also incorporates within it that wisdom is to bring about a strong sense of morality a strong sense of moral living wisdom is a living is designed to to teach us that righteous wisdom will be evidenced in our life it will be evidenced by our behavior wisdom taught must always include application. How is it being evidenced in my life? Any society that ignores spiritual wisdom, biblical wisdom, 
will inevitably experience chaotic moral breakdown. I'm not saying that just because of what's going on us around us today and say, oh, this is what's, what's happening. But I have believed this forever because it's according to the scriptures. When we ignore God, it is only a matter of time that society cannot stand. And in a way, when we remove God's moral standard from our culture, our God's moral wisdom, it is only a matter of time that we are signing our own death certi certificate. So in this passage, I kind of envisioned that uh, you, you've seen it in the movies where the camera is moving throughout the house and it's moving around and all of a sudden it begins to, to draw into this room. And as you're being drawn into this room, you see this, this man sitting in a chair, sort of like I'm sitting in a chair now. And he's intently talking to somebody. And as the camera pans the room, all of a sudden you see a son, children, sitting, listening to what the father is saying. And that's what this Proverbs 2 is like. And, and the intensity of the conversation is so much so that Pro Proverbs 2 is almost like the, the dad is trying to, to give this all in one breath because he recognizes the urgency of teaching wisdom to his children because life is so short. And it's like, you've got to catch this now, son. You have to catch this now, daughter. You have to catch this now to be able to live in this world in a manner that is pleasing to God. What we need to notice as we look through this Proverbs is that dad's emphasis is not given for the sake of success, is not given for the sake of, of, <clears throat> of comfort, but rather he is, he is communicating to his children. Do wisdom for the sake of godliness, righteousness. And it's with the intention of conveying this in such a manner that they, they in turn testify of this to future generations. And in the end, when we teach our children wisdom is with the intent that God may be glorified. I just want to read a few verses and then, and then we'll continue on. We begin with the value of wisdom. We begin with, with what the father's trying to teach his son. I, I like to put it in their children because that whether it's girl or boy, they all need to know what is moral wisdom. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your hearts to understanding, yes, if you call out for and raise your voice for understanding. If you seek it like silver and search for it for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. I just want to pause there for a second. I chose a word here that hopefully conveys men's responsibilities, dad's responsibilities, and it's this word ambassador. You are God's ambassador. You are the one that is to be responsible for teaching your children all kinds of things, which include biblical insight into moral living in order that they may grow up to become more Christ-like, that they will desire to be holy as God is holy. You are to instill into the heart of your children this impassioned quest for living wisely in a very unwise world. All the while we're teaching, we need to understand this. No matter how great your teaching may be, no matter how wise your communication may be, it is not a guarantee that your children will embrace it. This is the reason why it's most important for us to, 
not give up and to continue instructing our children. Spurgeon wrote this. He said, Solomon made a book of Proverbs, but a book of Proverbs won't make a Solomon. And that is very insightful because here's the man, Solomon, writing these Proverbs. He's, they're, they're right, they're true, but he himself did not follow through like he should have. And that's the same thing with our children. They may hear what we say, but they may not always do what we ask them to do. And that's the reason why I say this father's impassioned. Oh, son, if you hear this, if you listen, be attentive. Just concentrate on this, because if you do look at what will bring benefit into your life, then it'll bring clarity to your thinking. Then you begin to understand how to fear God and why it's so important to fear him. How do we do this? I say we're only limited by our imagination. I think the sky's the limit as to how we train our children, how we teach them. It must be always guarded and guided by God's Word. And then we should go after it and take every advantage we can to train and teach our children wisdom. Just like Deuteronomy says, when we rise up, when we sit down, whatever venue we are in, look for opportunities. Sometimes I find dads they're, they're, they're faithful in instruction, but unfaithful in spiritual wisdom. They want to be more buddies with their children, bro, than they're desiring to instill godly living in the life of their children. So wisdom is taught. What happens when wisdom is taught, when wisdom is sought? This is dad speaking here. And I'm only going to bring out five principles in this particular chapter. And what we find here, and I already read one through five, but one through four, what's the first thing we find here? When wisdom is taught and sought, it promotes an intensified desire to pray and know God's word. We are to assist our children in developing and having a love the Word of God. And we only do this by telling them and encouraging them that the only way you're going to know God's Word is by in, intently, with an, in, being intentional to search the Word of God and to search it carefully. Look, it says, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments. These are commands that he's giving to his children. You need to, you need to embrace this. Make your ears attentive. Incline your understanding. Call out for insight, which is an interesting statement there. In other words, we are to teach our children. We are to teach them how to live in a way that they will accept what we have to say to them. Actually, let me put it this way. We desire to accept and not criticize God's word knowing that it is only by God's word they're going, they will be able to understand and know and fear God. He says, call out. Yes, if you call out for insight. What is that? That's prayer. Prayer is the indication of our need of dependence upon God to give us clarity of thought, and insight into wisdom living. If we generally desire wisdom, we must pray for it. We must go after it. And when we do, God will supply it. If you call. The Apostle James said this, if any of you lack, he should ask of God who gives it generously. Conversely, our children need to understand, and Dad needs to teach this, is that no one will find God if they are not in the Word and they lack the initiative to pray. That is the import behind verses 1 through 4. The pursuit of wisdom is not to be done infrequently, but rather it is to be done with a daily routine of life. 
It is a lifetime operation. By as we get older, we still need more wisdom. We still need to know and understand who God is and, and the disciplines of life. But we must understand if this is not done, if we fail in this area, and you have to impress it upon your son, sons and daughters, if you fail in this area, there will be nothing safe to keep you from a bad decision. Which leads me to the second. Let's read the passages. Verse 5, it says, Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. So right away here in, in verse uh, 6, we find the source of wisdom. It's God himself. The source of wisdom comes by revelation and by discipleship. The Lord gives wisdom for his mouth, from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the ways of the saints. Number two would be this. When wisdom is taught and sought, it promises you will gain a better understanding of the character of God. The source of wisdom. The source of wisdom. God ex is, reveals himself. He, you begin to learn a little bit more and more about who he is, and then the fear of God begins to overtake you, where you desire to live rightly before him, knowing that he has, he has no uh, patience, if you will, for disobedience, but he has a love when he sees obedience. It's like saying this. Okay, let me, let me, let me put it this way, as if I'm talking to my children. Son, daughter, when you pursue God with thoroughness, it is then you begin to gain an understanding of the fear of the Lord. And understand this. Without the Spirit of God steering your souls to fear God, you will lack discerning wisdom. We must understand that this wisdom teaching cannot be done separate from Jesus Christ, who is the wise, all wise one. He is wisdom personified. And with the assistance of the Holy Spirit, it is then that we depend upon him where we will begin to see the character of God. We'll begin to see what we are to do to please God. The thing we need to understand here is that he says, the Lord gives wisdom to those who. In other words, wisdom is exclusive. And God reserves his blessings his promised blessings only for his holy people. Wisdom is only allotted to those who walk in integrity. So a person, granted, can be, even an adult can be a, a Christian, but he can be an unwise one because, because he is not walking in obedience to the things of God. He lacks in the area of the knowledge of God. He lacks in the area of understanding. And because of that, he will not walk in an integritous way. And God says, I reserve my wisdom. It's exclusive only for those who are walking in a manner of holiness according to my standards. So we see here that it promotes wisdom, this, this wisdom that's taught inside, it promotes this desire to be in prayer, to be in God's word, it, 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 um, it promises that when we are pursuing God, we'll begin to understand more about who God is. Verse 9 through 11 now is this. It provides an ability to do something here. Verse 9. 
Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you. These words should be highly, highly uh, soothing to you because of what wisdom can do for you. And it provides, number three, then it provides the ability to develop an ethical conscience to know the right way. It's not uncommon to hear today, I just don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. I don't know what kind of decisions I should be making. Oftentimes, instead, those statements are, are made in a vacuous absence of God. They haven't been pursuing God. They haven't pursue, been pursuing wisdom. And when a life decision comes along, they're at a loss. I find that once you know God, other things begin to fall into place. Discretion. Understanding will protect you, will guard you. Unless we know God, we will never properly, as verse 9 says, understand what is right, what is just, and what is fair. Look at our culture today. Wherever you look, People don't know what's right, they don't know what's just, and they don't know what's fair. Only when we have the mind of Christ will we have the ability to know what is right. Only then will we know what the right path will be. Heavenly wisdom and knowledge, God-given discretion and understanding, when we are pursuing these, they will be there when we are pursuing godly wisdom. What I find is this. With godly wisdom, as the writer here is pointing out, with godly wisdom comes spiritual discernment. And with spiritual discernment comes wise moral choices. You have to be discerning in order to know what is moral. And to know what is moral, you must have a knowledge of the character of God. To know what is moral, you must have the abiding work of the Holy Spirit in you who gives you the ability to be discerning. Wisdom, as it shows here, will guard you. Wisdom will watch over you. Wisdom is the safeguard to ensure success in seeking and finding the right, proper, and good path. The next point is going to, you're going to realize the importance of wisdom. You're going to see the necessity as, as the father is teaching his children, he's teaching his son, that the reason, there's another reason why you need to know wisdom is because you're going to have some opposition in your life. And he's going to point out two, verses 12 through 19. One melds into the other because 11 says discre discretion uh, will watch over you, understanding will guard you. What's it going to do? Delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, who forsake the paths of unripe uprightness, to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil, men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. So you'll be delivered from the forbidden woman or the strange woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsake the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God, for her house sinks down to death and her, and her paths to the departed. None who go to her come back, nor do they gain, regain the path of life. This is a dad giving fair warning to to his children. There's, there's two dangerous people in the world, he is saying. There are evil men and there's this and what makes them unsafe? Well, with the men, with the evil men, 
is moral corruption. And with the evil woman, I'll call it that, with the evil woman, there's moral compromise. Two things to remember that you're going to encounter. You're going to encounter, you're going to encounter two types of people. One that will, will, will really try to interview, uh, to influence you to be corrupt morally. But there's going to also be another kind of person who's going to come to you and wants you to compromise what is moral. Evil men. Let's look at that. What are they intent on? They're intent on leading the righteous down a torturous path. How? Through corrupted speech and immoral behavior. Now, what makes this so dangerous? What makes this so inviting? It makes it so dangerous. It makes it so inviting is because the atmosphere in which it's conveyed. These men enjoy what they do is party time and they make it look inviting. You see, when men sin, they never want to sin alone. It is just as what Paul says when he speaks in Romans 1 with the devolution of a culture. He says, when men begin to go against the very things that God stands for, what they will do is they'll look around. They, they not only want to do them, but they will give approval to those who practice with them. In other words, the invitation, the pressure is on. Come and join in with us. And so what dad does is he needs to sit down and begin to explain these types of people because they're not going to hang around with you for very long. These are what we call pseudo friends. As the first chapter 111 says, these pseudo friends come with their lies. They never tell you the truth. They never tell you the consequences. They never tell you the outcome. And they will leave you holding the bag. So dad speaks, warning with, with his wisdom, warning that these come with deceitful deceit and you need to detect it. And so what is he's doing? Dad is lining it out. He's saying, here's the kind of people they are. This is what they're going to do. And so he's, he's building up this, this information piece in the minds of his children so that when they are, when they are confronted with it, they have something to, to recall and say, whoa, this is what dad warned us of. This is not good. Let's go. Sort of like, if you haven't loaded it into the computer and then you go to try to find it, it's not there. Just like dad needs to be loading his children's minds with what is morally right, what is, what is, what is good and righteous and holy. But here's the second danger point. And, and I think it's, it is specifically towards the son, but it can include daughters as well. And this is what I call the moral compromise that can easily beset the unwise. It's in a sense we find dad giving fair warning to his naive son. His son is still, he has not been met with enough life to be able to discern what type of person this is. What's, what's so dangerous about her? I give it easy to remember. Language and looks. Her words drip like honey and her looks are used to manipulate the person that she wants to bring down. Unlike evil men, they use perverse words to snare the unwary. But a covenant-breaking woman, because that's what this is, there's two things. She has no respect for God and she has no respect for her husband. And she will use her flattering words. She will use every allurement that she can find to take a person, a young man, and bring him down. The thing that is often not seen or said 
is that any who follow this type of person will suffer inevitable consequences, as the writer of Proverbs says. And they will suffer of the direst kind. There will be loss. They don't know what it will be, but there will be loss. For you see, at the moment, the consequence of evil is never taken into account when the evil deed is done. And then when the consequences come, what happens is that they, they wail and they moan and they, they try to absolve themselves. It's not my fault. And the dad is warning the son, son, look at this. Um, her house sinks down to death. None who go to her come back. She devours and destroys. Son, run. You see what precedes that, though? My number, it, it, it protects by, by discerning. It protects you from this. By learning wisdom, it protects you from this. It is knowing and applying wisdom that's going to keep you safe from the various forms of evil that will come your way. We, as a dad, you can't protect your children from all things, but you can provide a framework in which they'll be able to discern those things that do come against them. We, we, we must rely on the Holy Spirit, knowing that Jesus too was tempted in all points, but he never caved. And he is our model. He is the one that we look to. And Paul says, there is no temptation such as coming to man, but God will make a way for you to escape. What's that escape? Go the other way. Don't fall into the trap. Know that the Holy Spirit has given you enough resources that you can succeed and move on. Verses 20 to 22. So, you will walk in the way of the good and keep to the path of the righteous. For the upright will inhabit the land, and those with integrity will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous will be rooted out. I just wanted to give one little point on these past, last few verses, and it's this. What does this pursuit do? What does this teaching do when wisdom is taught and sought? Well, it pursues the good and righteous path. Notice these words, along with others. The wise never or do not travel alone. And I think that's something that we must all remember. We cannot succeed by ourselves. These final few verse, verses here show us that there's no such thing as the Lone Ranger. It reminds us as dads that we have to teach our children that God reserves it for those who are his holy people. We're finding here that we have to repeat again and again and again to our children that if we walk a walk that is blameless, just, and faithful, it must be, first and foremost, done through the wisdom of Christ. And it must also be applied through the reality of his word. Without him, it is impossible. I believe that we must impress all of this upon our loved ones. As I said, that this is not a lone ranger journey. Look at the words. So you will walk in the way of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous. That means there's more than just one person here that there are many people who are desiring to walk in wisdom and follow the path of righteousness. Go with them. For the upright, that's including more than just one person, will inhabit the land, and those with integrity will remain. So you look for people who have moral integrity. You look for people who, who uh, are walking in righteousness and they're walking in holiness. Those are the people that you travel with. Those are the ones that you journey with. You pursue the good and righteous path along with others. The wise do not travel alone. We can't survive 
if we try to walk morally, wisely by ourselves. Blessings come through holiness. But without wisdom, let me clarify, but without biblical wisdom, we never shall be holy because we won't be wise enough. I want to phrase this next paragraph like this as a dad speaking to his children. My, my beloved, <laughs> my children, my son, my daughter, as a father, if you accept what God's word says, it is then you'll begin to understand what is right, what is just, and what is fair. It is then that you begin to see that good path that you are to be walking down. It is then that wisdom will enter into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. It is then discretion will protect you and understanding will guard you. You need to understand until wisdom comes, there can be no blessing. My children, remember the way to holiness is the way of wisdom. The choice is yours. Choose the right Call out to Christ. Call out to Christ for insight. Cry out loud for understanding. Look to him. Look for him. As you would for silver. Search for him as a hidden treasure. For then you will understand the fear of the Lord. And then you will find the knowledge of God, which of course is the key to true wisdom. Let me end with just this one thought. Nothing is of greater importance than for you, dad, to instill into the heart of your children how to have a steadfast faith in God for it is then that it will perpetuate divine wisdom through multiple generations. May God have his blessings upon the hearing of his word. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful that we can spend just a moment looking at your word and seeing that as dads, we are to be responsible for our children and instilling into them spiritual wisdom, instilling into them discernment and wisdom and understanding, instilling into them the ability to fear you and to walk in holiness. I pray for dads that they will take this admonition seriously and with an intensity, day in and day out, desire to instill wisdom into the hearts and minds of their children. For your glory. Amen.